Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Earlier this month, we talked about the fears surrounding AI technology, even end of humankind as we know it scenarios. But are those fears exaggerated? Let's get to the bottom line. The launch of ChatGPT last year sparked a huge debate across the globe and a gold rush of investors who are pouring billions to push artificial intelligence. The debate on AI usually has three scenarios. It's either going to take our jobs or it's going to revolutionize the economy or it's going to end the world. So will robots really replace everybody? Lawyers, journalists, truck drivers, accountants, you name it, maybe even me. And even worse, will the human species lose out to a much more powerful computer species sooner rather than later? My guest today says there's no such thing as artificial intelligence and we shouldn't fall for all the hype. He is Jaron Lanier, a computer scientist, a musical composer, a visual artist, and co-founder of Virtual Reality, and the author of several books on the future of humanity and technology, including 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Jaron, it's a real pleasure to have you on today with us and to help us have a deep dive into this complex discussion. And let me just start with it. You wrote a, a, a mesmerizing, riveting article in The New, New Yorker, uh, and it was called There Is No AI. Tell us what you meant by that, uh -huh. by that provocation. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, I I spend all day uh, working on bringing AI to the world. So I uh, I uh, I think that what we're doing is useful. Uh, however, what I meant when I said there is no AI is it's important to remember that when we talk about AI, we're talking about a new kind of collaboration where the efforts, the creativity of a large number of people are brought together in a new way. Uh, when you ask ChatGP to write something for you, it's not some electronic brain in the sky. What it's doing is a statistical mashup of other things that people have written. The same thing is true when it writes code for you. The same thing is true in all the other cases. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think new ways for people to collaborate is a fantastic use of technology. I just don't think this fantasy that we're building a big brain in the sky is helpful. I think it's better to keep track of the, the absolute fact that what we're really doing is mashing up the efforts of real people. And I like the idea of recognizing and celebrating those people. I hate the idea of people being made to feel small or like they're being left behind or that they're less important because there's this big electronic brain, because there isn't. All there is is the people. And I like us to remember that. It makes everything clearer. It makes the programs easier to use, less mysterious, safer to use. <laughs> everything about it gets better. How do you deal with the fact that there's a lot of falsehood in the world? There's a lot of fabrication and mistruth and even deceit that's built into that, those archives. How do we know that we don't become a victim in that case? Yeah, well, this is one of the key problems of our times. I mean, this is like one of the challenges of our era. In my opinion, there's a few things we should at least try that we haven't done much of. One of them is uh, incentivize high-quality information. So right now, uh, if the main reward from being online is to get attention, well, the best way to get attention is to be a moron. I mean, honestly, look at any playground. That's what works. Mm. And so we've we've generated a lot of moronic communication online uh, from people who have. I, I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with seeking attention, but if it's the main or the only thing, it's a problem. It has to be in balance. And this is where I think we made a gigantic mistake by demonetizing content for the sake of advertising online, because you know when somebody pays you for something when there's a little bit of skin in the game all of a sudden the expectations go up but then there's this other thing i wish we would do right now we treat the internet as a sea of individuals um each against each you know each against each and uh what i'd rather see is people forming into little groups together becoming little brands or little journals or little little uh, collectives or little corporations, whatever, you know, whatever suits you culturally, um, and where they rise and fall together. And I think there are a lot of advantages for that. Then people can sort of prod each other to not get too nutty. Somebody will say, hey, we share the same brand. Don't go so crazy on us, you know? Or they might say, I'm tired. I can't post every day. If we can just share, we can build up an audience and it makes more sense. And another thing is, um, 
in the world I'd like to see where more people are getting paid for their contributions online, whether through AI or social media or whatever. In that world, it's unpredictable who will go viral, almost by definition. So if you have a collection of people and if you go viral, sure, they should benefit, but not totally with everybody else getting nothing. There should be a way of smoothing it out. It's almost like an insurance policy. You never know who go viral. So if you form a cooperative agreement with other people, then as long as somebody goes viral, everybody at least gets by. Um, that's how you hedge against uncertainty. Uh, so those are some of the techniques that I think would improve the general quality without it being top-down imposition of censorship. Do you need the kind of world you're describing connected to something that creates basic provision for a lot of people that may not play well in the environment you just, you just shared? Well, you know, I think we really have to have a new kind of recognition that we need market economies around individual real humans if we want to have a modern world that serves real humans, you know? Um, and if this world's gonna involve a lot of AI and robots or just a lot of technology, we have to accept that the information coming from people is their labor. There's no mm. other thing to pay them for in that world. Um, I, I'm really concerned that if we end up with a different solution, like a universal basic income, where everybody just gets money, that central organization that distributes that money will be subject to astonishing pressures to be corrupted or taken over. And that, that's always been what's gone wrong with idealistic uh, communist experiments. And I mean, when I say always, I mean like always. It's like a lesson we should learn by now. It's just too tempting a target. So this idea of this centralized source of sustenance for everybody is not politically or societally viable. It's not actually distributed. Uh, anyway, so those are some of my thoughts. I think they're pretty obvious, and yet they're not widely held. I don't know why. <laughs> well, because hopefully this, this show will uh, launch them even further. We'll have it. But, <laughs> but let me ask you, I mean, you have a kind of um, inspiring hope that I think many people don't have. They, they look at this world somewhat cynically. We've been through an era with social media, which you could argue in the terms you talk about in the New York New Yorker article is social collaboration created those opportunities and there were some positives that came out of that but what we mm -hmm. saw was toxicity we see divided nations not just in the United States but all around the world where the sense is that social media has sent people into their cocoons or their hives they hang out with people they don't get their apertures are narrowed not broadened and I'm just interested as you kind of raise this this question about the health and the DNA of AI which, which uh, you know, I know we're contending with the title of that, but there was this um, a hearing in the Senate in May where Professor Gary Marcus of New York University laid out his concern, sounds similar to your concerns, but maybe he's in a little slightly more cynical point. Let's listen to him. The big tech company's preferred plan boils down to trust us, but why should we? The sums of money at stake are mind-boggling. Humanity has taken a back seat. AI is moving incredibly fast with lots of potential, but also lots of risks. So my question is, and I, uh, you know, coming back to this question of humanity, and is it in front of the process or is it behind it? He's arguing we're already behind it. How do you deal with some of the doubters in this who've already decided that mankind, humankind is going to be a victim in this process? Well, look, I have, first I have to say, uh, Gary's a friend and I'm supportive of what he's doing, even if we don't totally agree. My concern about the approach that Gary is taking is that whenever somebody says, oh, there's this AI, this AI is scary, it's sort of reifying or, or kind of elevating the status of this AI thing. And then what that does is it elevates, uh, you know, uh, the big companies that own the big AIs. Right now, you can't make it. You can make sort of AIs in your garage, but mostly it's a, it's a very very expensive big game that only a very few parties in the world can play, and so if you believe in it in that way, even if the critique is valid, putting it that way of saying, oh, there's this AI thing, what it does is it sort of grants uh, us in the tech industry a kind of power that we shouldn't have, even though it's in the form of a criticism of us. You know, like what we should say is. There's no AI. Those guys are just taking your work, scrambling it in a new way, and then selling it back to you to make you feel like you're, you're going obsolete. And that's not fair. And, and I think that's actually a more accurate description 
Uh, that doesn't mean the big companies are evil. I think that scrambling or the, the mashup process is really valuable, and uh, they should deserve to be paid for it as much as anybody else doing a service. But I think this idea, you know, we, we're reliving the science fiction we saw when we were kids. We saw the Terminators movies, and we saw the Matrix movies, and we're like, oh, it's the big AI. But it's just wiser to not give tech companies that level of power. It's just wiser to say, hey, you're just mashing up what we did, and that's great. Thank you for doing that. But don't tell us that it's a replacement for us. It's not true. And, and, and I, I just think that's the better approach. And it, it contains the same critique. I just think it's wiser. Are you worried that the genie is out of the bottle somewhat, and that as we begin thinking about the evolution and getting the, the human portion of it right, there may be other players that also have researchers, money, investment, market share globally mm -hmm. that can play by different rules. All right, well, first of all, yeah, I'm the prime scientist of Microsoft, but I have an explicit re uh, arrangement with them where I can speak my own mind even if it's not an agreement. And right now I'm speaking my own mind. This is not a Microsoft point of view. One of the reasons for that is that I think tech companies are getting more and more influential. And I just want to prove that, yeah, you can have a tech company with a top scientist who speaks his own mind, and yet the company can still be worth trillions of dollars. And it, it doesn't hurt investors. It doesn't hurt customers. I think I want to establish that. And I'd like our colleagues over at Google and Apple and Amazon to also recognize that there are benefits to doing things that way. I just really think tech culture should change that way. I think it's to everyone's benefit. Um, all right. And then as far as your question about bad actors or, or uh, actors with less in integrity competing, um, I'll tell you, I want to be really frank, and I don't want to sound xenophobic. I don't want to sound paranoid, but I'm worried about China. You know, like um, uh, we uh, in the U.S., we've allowed China to own the social media platform that our young people are the most uh, connected to, which is TikTok. And China is one of those entities in the world that has the scale and the expertise to play in big model AI. There aren't too many, but China definitely can do it if they want. And they do. And there are scenarios where TikTok could be used in a devastating way in the event of a heightened conflict. Um, there are some who believe there's already a bit of malicious interference in TikTok. And I want to say, I don't think TikTok is all bad. I love dance culture on TikTok. I think it's great, you know, so it's, I don't want to sort of condemn everything about it. Uh, but for instance, my friend Tristan Harris has been tracking it and is of the belief that the American version of TikTok contains uh, material calculated to subtly and gradually degrade our society and especially our young people, whereas the Chinese version is just the opposite. And it has a feedback loop to try to encourage them to be uh, healthy and successful and that there is a sort of a societal large scale level, very subtle and gradual kind of weaponization uh, that involves AI algorithms over this platform. I'm not sure about that. I don't have enough information. I, I will say that there are clear scenarios where TikTok could be weaponized kind of dramatically. And I, I think it's appalling that we as a nation or we as a species have allowed ourselves to get into this position and we simply must undo it. Uh, so uh, I think... The concerns are real. Um, I, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I still think the clearest way to address them is not to grant sort of mythological super status to AI as like this big brain in the sky, but instead to treat it as a way of just combining the efforts of people using statistics. That's really what it is. What I just said is technically accurate, and we don't need to... We don't right. need to make it fancier than that. But I ask you, in this um, earnest, forward-looking, and humane way of looking at the possibilities, should we hedge against you being wrong? I, um, I mean, I guess my answer is to a degree, sure, you know. I mean, the question is, what does that mean? For instance, um, 
I have found that the existential risk type people in AI who, who are concerned that AI will come alive and jailbreak and take over and then eat us or destroy us all, um, the types of fixes that they imagine make all the other problems worse. And so it's a funny kind of hedging. Um, they make the other problems worse because then you need more AI to fix the first AI and you end up with this tower of AI programs looking at AI programs. And then it, the people get lost in that. You just mm. have this giant uh, set of automations trying to moderate automations. That's what happens when you go down that road. And I think it just becomes absurd. Like, I don't, I don't think it's a well-formed idea. Right. Um, if hedging means making it more human-centric, then it's absolutely coherent and essentially the same thing I'm saying. But what it usually means where there's a possible distinction with what I'm saying is that you use AI to moderate the AI. And I really just be, think that becomes a tower of nonsense. You know, right. I, I really do. Um, there are a lot of people who are enthused uh, for that approach, you know, and there's certainly, uh, and you can't talk them out of it. I mean, the people who believe in that really, really believe in it. And they really believe that what they need to do is make this good AI that won't hurt people. Um, this has been, a fantasy for a very long time. It started in a dialogue between my mentor, uh, Marvin Minsky, and a science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, who talked about laws for robotics going back to the 50s, I believe. Mm. Um, and the problem with it is it's very much like the ancient stories about the genie in the bottle that you mentioned. And I should remind you that genies don't exist. But at any rate, <laughs> in the stories about in the stories about genies, the genie grants you wishes. And right. then you try to come up with wishes, but the genie always twists them, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's exactly that problem, which has been known since ancient times, that that you can't automate away the behavior of some autonomous genie thing because it'll always twist what you say. You never really know, you know, like it's an, it's not a possible, it's not a coherent project, you know, and um, uh, but I feel like people still want to rub you know, still want to try to trick the genie. And I don't think you can. It doesn't mean the genie's smart. It sort of means that the genie's stupid in a way, but I don't think you can do that. I don't think there's any way to set down a perfect automated thing that expresses human interests. I think what you have to do is make the overall situation human-centric and not give a bunch of credence to machines as these other players. I, I just think it's the only... It's not a question of hedging about whether I'm wrong. It's just like choosing things that you can actually talk about and that right. actually give you plausible things to do. Um, it, it's just like what right. is actionable and what isn't, you know? Well, I find myself wanting the world that you describe, and I think having a human-centric notion about that empowers us is very, very compelling and one you'd hope for. You, you introduced some term that I find so intriguing, and I'm just interested. We, we have very little time, but... You know, how do you animate data dignity and how does data dignity fit oh. into the way in which you think we might be able to right size some of these discussions and debates? Well, uh, the history of that is that um, I've been concerned for quite a while that this idea that people's data is just taken and then they get free services in exchange uh, has a tendency to elevate the power of certain tech companies or perhaps governments in an untenable and unstable way. And so it would be better for people to be paid and that that's really the only form of distributed power. And But there's also just a question of dignity. I think a whole lot of people in the world feel left behind by where modernity seems to be going. Uh, I think you see this in the politics and also in the religious feeling all over the world that when people hear tech, when people hear people from Silicon Valley, just somebody who's not in Silicon Valley hears some, one of us say, oh, our thing will become super intelligent, smarter than people. People won't be needed anymore. People might be served if we're lucky and if the machines don't kill us, but they certainly won't be needed because the machines will be better at everything. How do you think that makes people feel? Like they're being made obsolete, like their children are being made obsolete. And of course, if it were true, that'd be one thing. But since it's all just a mashup of what those same people do, it's a, it's a grotesque lie. There's no other word to use. And so... Um, if you have everybody feeling like modernity is robbing them of dignity, then what you should be thinking about is what would be a future scenario that doesn't do that, in which people are justifiably dignified because they earned it. 
you know, and that would be an honest, totally plausible reality, a much more honest one than the alternative. And so that's called data dignity. Oddly enough, I don't, I don't know if, I, he, he definitely does not endorse everything I say, but that term data dignity was coined by a certain such in Adela, uh, and uh, who, who, who's running Microsoft rather well, I might add. And uh, uh, Satya comes from a background in India where he's very much aware of uh, the struggle for uh, bringing up poor people into into economic dignity. And I think he, he kind of got it in a way that maybe some others might not as, as easily. But I think we just have to go there if we want a happy, stable, or honest world. You know, I think we have to go there. Let me just ask you finally, uh, you know, and I don't mean this as a schmaltzy question, question at all, but you know, there are a lot of young people that watch this. And, you know, I hear this um, vision of hope and confidence and, you know, the options ahead. Uh, you know, you're talking to young people. How do you get them to choose that track rather than, say, fearing what's coming next and cynicism? Mm. Yeah, that worries me a lot. Young people have been given a kind of a rough um, psychological context now because we have the climate issues at the same time as we have political insanity all over the world at once at the same time as we have insane making unreliable information systems the worst in many generations um we have all these things at once and then a lot of them had to come of age during a lockdown it really sucks for them and i really feel badly for them um i um uh, i guess what i'd say is that a lot of people who like to think about the status quo where AI is a real thing and technology will solve our problems in a sort of a remote way instead of in a human centric way. Um, they always imagine that they'll be on the good side of it. They'll imagine, well, when the AI takes over, it'll favor me because I'm nerdy or I know the right people or whatever. Um, and uh, that is always a mistake. You know, if a Hollywood studio person thinks, oh, AI will favor me, so screw the actors and the writers who are on strike. No, you know, big tech companies will roll right over you if they want to. It's mm. You're not special. Uh, anybody who thinks that they're going to be on the favored side of the way things go is kidding themselves unless they happen to own the giant data sensors, centers of the big AI <laughs> programs. So the way out of this is to grow the economy by everybody being a first-class citizen and getting paid for their contributions. And I like it from a corporate point of view because then they'll have more money to buy our stuff. Like, I think growing the economy is good for everybody in a, in a market economy. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not all against all. It's all help all. That's what capitalism should be about. Let's play it that way. And that we should do it with AI just like we should with everything else. What a great conversation. Humanist and computer scientist, Jaron Lanier, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. I'm very pleased to. Good luck to you. So what's the bottom line? My guest today is a humanist. He has great confidence in our ability, all of us, to get the balance right in making sure technology does what we want and not vice versa. I wish I could share his belief in society's spirit and competence when it comes to the evolution of artificial intelligence. Look at the record. We saw the convergence of data and human connectivity in platforms like Twitter, now called X, and in Instagram and TikTok and more. And we saw algorithms let loose their power and drive toxicity and drive people apart. Of course, we've seen amazing moments of empathy and problem solving, too. But still, we've had test runs of tech having just too much power. We love facial recognition, but it's become a tool for chasing people down, not just in China and the U.S., but all across the world. It was fascinating to get two opposite perspectives on our future under AI. Sure, the possibilities are endless, but the risks are scary, too. I can only agree with the late tech titan Andy Grove who said, being paranoid may be the best strategy to survive. And that's the bottom line.